get started here. I'm, I'm going to do a QA. and a And uh, my thought was that, well, the market's closed today. So I'll come on here, do a live stream and give you guys uh, some time. So uh, I hope you guys are all doing well today. And I'm going to jump right in with the first question. But those of you guys tuning in for the live broadcast, please post questions in the comment stream. And I'm going to look through them. And I'm going to try to answer the questions that I think are going to be the most uh, relatable to the most people. So everyone uh, tuning in and listening to this broadcast will get some great value out of it. Okay, so the first um, topic that I'm going to hit on, which is a question I just saw in the comments last night, um, is about the brokers I'm using for my small account challenges. Okay, so many of you guys know, in January, I started a brand new small account. And I, small account challenges are something that I've been doing for a long time. And one of the things I really like about doing small accounts is that you, I feel like it's a protected environment. And I actually almost would say, I think everyone at some point should do a small account. Because when you fund an account with $500 or $1,000 and you're trading in it, you may make some mistakes and that's fine the the damage is low the the total amount that you can lose is very minimal whereas a trader perhaps who has the money could fund an account with 25,000 30,000 40,000 50,000 dollars and a mistake there could be life changing and i feel like as a beginner trader you don't want to position yourself to ever make a mistake that could be life changing. You want to keep the the guardrails on. It's just like a beginner driver. You don't want to give a beginner driver a Rolls Royce or a Ferrari or something like that to drive as their first car because they're going to make mistakes. Everyone does when they get started. You want to, you know, learn to drive in a beater that doesn't really matter if it gets scratched or dinged. And with trading is sort of similar. You want to start trading in a safe environment where, um, where, where the total impact of you know a, a mistake is is very minimal. And I think the other thing that I like about trading in a small account is that if you make a mistake, most likely if it's a big mistake, your account's going to be deactivated until you add more money. And that sounds like a bad thing, but if you only lose seven hundred dollars or something like that, bear with me. It's actually a good thing because it forces you to take a step back and reevaluate and ask yourself, what am I doing right now that's working? What am I doing that's not working? Whereas if you had five or $10,000, you probably wouldn't take a step back. You would keep trading, you would keep spiraling, and you would get more and more emotionally invested. So a small account really forces you to be very disciplined from a very, you know, from the very beginning as a trader, to manage your risk, to bail out quickly, and to focus on one trade at a time. Sometimes traders with big accounts will be in one trade and it's a losing trade and then they're just like, well, I'll hold that and I'll go focus on something else. And that's really not a good habit as a beginner. Okay, so um, so Ike and Dan, yes, this is a live broadcast. So I'm gonna answer questions um, that you guys have uh, here. Okay, so... Let's see. So I'm going to scroll up in the chat feed um, to one of the last questions that I saw. Um, let's see. All right. So so question here, Ross, uh, I'm using the offshore broker that you're using. Uh, any tips on how to save on fees? It seems very pricey for me for the first month. Okay. So, um, so what I've noticed with the broker um, that I'm using, and I'm going to, let's see. I'll switch this, roll this over to this other side. Um, I'm using an offshore broker as well. Uh, same broker, it sounds like, that you're using. And the idea with this broker is that I can deposit uh, $500 and I have uh, six times leverage. So that means I have $3,000 in buying power, which is great. All right, so now if I see a stock, just for instance, at six dollars a share i could buy 500 shares for three thousand dollars now if the stock goes up to 650 i can sell for a profit of 250 dollars and in one day my account's up 50 percent even though the underlying stock only went up about a little less than 10 percent my account's up 50 percent because i'm using leverage now just as a comment on leverage for a moment um, those of you who may trade futures or Forex, you know, certainly in Forex, traders use a, a tremendous amount of leverage. And the reason they use a lot of leverage is because the amount of movement in the underlying asset, a, a currency pair like the US dollar to the euro, 
the actual amount that it's moving is really very small. We're talking about fractions of a penny. So when the moves are that small, yes, you still have a chart and you're going to look at the chart and you're going to see, you know, that the, the, the chart's moving, you know, up or down, you have a bull flag and, and you've got volatility, but you're talking about a total range of maybe not even a penny, fractions of a penny. So similar with trading uh, an actual penny stock, in order to make money when something has that small of a range, you need to take more size. And so what a lot of traders in Forex do is they'll use leverage, up to 100 times leverage, sometimes even higher, in order to make profit on such a small move. So when you have a small account, leverage is, is common practice. However, as a beginner trader, as a beginner, it's best not to use leverage at first. It's best first, of course, to train a simulator, prove profitability, and then start trading with tiny size, even just one share or 10 shares. Again, prove profitability with small size and then increase as you go. Now, when it comes to the commissions, so the commission structure, um, let's see, with the broker that I'm using, it's if you buy a thousand shares, their current commission structure is uh, 0 .005, uh, I believe. So it's half of one penny for every share you trade, uh, which is actually, this is not bad. So a thousand shares, one, if you were paying one penny on a thousand shares, you'd be paying 10 bucks, right? So half a penny would be $5. Um, and, and for me, that's tolerable. Um, you know, so it's $5 to buy $5 to sell. Now I I'm, I am aware of the fact that they're actually doing some changes um, with the commission structure, depending on new accounts and older accounts. So anyways, um, but what I've generally found is that about 10% of my profit goes to commissions. So on a day where I make $100 in a trade, uh, usually I'll have about $10 in commissions. All right. So the problem here, though, is that if it's sort of based on cents per share because the commission is based on cents per share. So if you're trading a stock and you get in at $5 and you sell it at 502, well, in that case, you only made two, two cents uh, per share. And because half of a cent is going to the commission on the buy side, and then half is going to commission on the sell side of that transaction, you're actually gonna have about 50% of your profit go to fees and commissions. So in other words, I try to only focus on trades that I think have the potential to go up 15 to 20 cents a share. And then paying approximately one cent in commission per share is only, you know, is less than 10% of my total profit. So that's the way I think of it. The problem here is that if you were trying to trade a penny stock, well, you know, if you're trading a stock that's 11 cents a share, you need to get 10, 15, 20 cents to really, it's not going to work. So, uh, so for me, I found that the sweet spot for stocks to trade where I can make enough that the commission doesn't become burdensome is really stocks between five and $10 a share, two to 10 is fine. Uh, but a little bit on the higher price range where I can reasonably get 15, 20, maybe even 50 cents a share on a good trade. So naturally, some of my best trades so far during my small account challenge have been when I've been able to get a um, 25, 35, or 50 cent, even a dollar a share on a move. Okay, so thank you guys uh, who have been posting questions in the chat feed. Appreciate it. Okay, so what's my opinion on Trade Zero as an international broker? Uh, Trade Zero is fine as an international broker. It's a popular broker that a lot of people do use. Um, one of the things that I like about Trade Zero is that for um, for international traders, they have a commission structure where it's free. You actually pay no fees as long as you're using a limit order, uh, and a, and that's a non marketable limit order. So as long as you use the right type of order, you can get totally free commissions with um, Trade Zero. So I, I think that that's nice. But they do enforce the PDT rule for U.S. traders. So that's a little bit of a um, an issue there. Okay, so let's see. Next question. Um, let's see. I'm just scrolling down. Okay, so 
Um, where should a beginner who can't afford uh, expensive courses start with their education in order to become a profitable trader? So if you cannot afford expensive courses, you know that there's courses out there, there's courses that I have, there's courses other people have, but you just, you're like, I can't afford that. Okay, I'm going to give you two recommendations. The first is don't trade with real money yet. That's an important one. Sometimes people will say, I'll buy the course once I make my first X amount of money, once I make my first $10,000. But it doesn't work that way anywhere else. You can't, like, as a doctor, you can't operate on people until you make your first $10,000 and then go to medical school, right? You can't fly a couple of planes and then go to flight school. You won't have the skill to be able to do it successfully. So it's a misconception to think that, I will make a little money trading and then I'll invest that in my education because you won't make money until you're educated. Okay, so now the question is, how do I educate myself on a budget? How do I essentially educate myself for free? What I can tell you is that there is a tremendous amount of content out there on YouTube. There's a lot of content if you Google search. The problem for you is sifting through what is credible and what is not because there's a lot of people out there that put out information, but not all of it it's credible. Not all of it has been produced by someone who actually knows what they're doing. So for instance, especially in the last two years, there's a lot of people that have tried to make a living as a, as a like, you know, social media influencer in the financial space, because there's a lot of people that watch these videos. So there is incentive to make content just to try to make money, but they're not actually traders. They're not profitable traders. They're just content creators. And that's a problem because then anything they say, you have to take with a grain of salt because they don't even make money trading. They're trying to make money as an influencer. They're not making money as a trader. Now, I'm different because, you know, of course, my broker statements are audited and they're on my website. So you can check out them at any time. So so that's the first thing. So always ask, is the person I'm learning from credible? Are they qualified? Do they actually make money trading? So number one, what's their personal profitability? So if you don't know what their personal profitability, if they're profitable at all, uh, then that's that's a problem. You shouldn't be probably consuming content from that person. It's going to send you in the wrong direction. Then the second question when you're looking at uh, content out there is, does the strategy meet that this person is teaching meet with my risk profile? Now, you might find my strategy doesn't fit your risk profile because I'm too aggressive or you know whatever the case is. I trade small caps and you don't want to trade small caps. And that's fine. You got to choose... Uh, an educator that meets sort of aligns with your comfort. Sometimes when I was getting started, I, I saw people out there who um, like, you know, like a Jim Cramer or someone who's investing and is buying, you know, has is holding like 40 stocks at the same time. And I was like, that's not really someone that I should learn from because there's no way I'm going to be able to do that with a small account, right? So whatever they have to say, as interesting as it may be, is not really relatable or helpful for me right now because I can't apply it in, in my own learning. So, so this is your big challenge. But once you find somebody or a few people who are credible, qualified, and their strategy aligns with yours, I would watch all of their content. I would watch every single episode that you can. Now, the problem with my content that's on YouTube is that it's not... Um, it's not organized into a course. There's not, we don't have the quizzes. We don't have the PDF handouts and it's not everything that I have in my course, but that's also kind of the whole thing is I have a lot of free content on YouTube, but it's sort of disorganized. So if you don't mind going through and just trying to weed through all of it to find little pieces here and there, then you should do that because it's free and you can learn a lot just by doing that. It's not the same as going through the structured curriculum, but you can learn a lot. I would also encourage you to read. So if you want some recommended reading, I'll uh, share a couple books with you. Of course, you know, I've got my book, How to Day Trade the Plain Truth. We've got, um, from an educational standpoint, um, with Trading Psychology, Trade Mindfully by Gary Dayton. That's a book that I really like. Um, this, these two, Secrets of the Sows Bandits and Dark Pools, those are more like entertainment. They're not super relevant for your trading. Um, thinking in bets though, this is a good one for trading psychology and quit is also a good one. And the candlestick course by Steve Neeson. If you can find a used copy, this is also a decent book. Um, it's, it's like $50, $75, $75 US, 82 in Canadian. Um, well, this was many years ago, but anyways, um, this is way overpriced for what it is. I mean, you just watch my candlestick videos, honestly, that that'll be fine. Um, but those, those, that gives you some recommended reading. 
So you just have to do that. And you have to immerse yourself in, oops, you have to immerse yourself in watching as many of these episodes as you can, these Q&As, but also my full length episodes, just to continue to learn and learn and learn. And then practice in a simulator. Don't put real money on the line until you've first proven you can make money in a simulator. And is it going to take you longer than someone who's going through, you know, a, a sort of rigorous curriculum with like a, a proper learning path? Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. It just, it probably depends uh, in part on your own aptitude and your ability to be self-motivated. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, and again, you know, if you get to a point where you can save some money for your first trading account, obviously, um, you know, continue saving, continue investing in your education. Okay, so let's see. Next question. Um, so thank you guys, by the way. Uh, hey, anyone who's tuned in here for the live broadcast, uh, do me a favor real quick. If you hit the thumbs up, I would be super grateful. And if you want to share this stream, share it on Twitter, share it on Facebook, um, we'll let some other people uh, check it out. We're going to be streaming here for another like 45 minutes or so. I'm going to do about an hour long broadcast. Okay, so let's see. Um... Can the starter program be a good uh, step for a new trader? It, Connor, so yes, the Warrior Starter course that we have is literally called a starter for that reason. It's a great it's a great starter. It's a great introduction into the trading uh, courses that we offer here at Warrior Trading. We have the Warrior Starter and the Warrior Pro. Warrior Pro includes the starter, but some people want to just dip their toe in. So they begin with a starter and then they upgrade to the Pro. And it's that's not a problem at all. So you could do that anytime. Okay, so... Um, Let's see. So how to manage risk on a swing trade. Um, I don't think I'm going to cover that in this um, broadcast because I think most folks here are interested in learning more about uh, day trading. So here's a question. Do I day trade um, under a personal account or an LLC or an S-Corp? So um, how would you like me to tell you about how I pay zero income tax on my trading profit? Zero income tax. Okay, so this is how I do it. And many of you already know this, but I'll share it with you anyways. But I'll also share with you a couple other ways you could pay zero income tax on your trading. So for me, what I did, uh, I, I funded a small account back in 2017 with $600, $583.15, right? I grew the account up to 100 grand in 45 days. By the end of 2017, the account was at $335,000. Let's jump on the whiteboard. So it crossed in 2017, I was at $335,000. Now in 2017, the max contribution to a retirement account was $6,000. So I deposited $6,000 into a traditional IRA. I then converted it into a Roth IRA. This is called a backdoor conversion. And anytime you can convert a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, what you do when you do this conversion is you pay income tax on the contribution, which was $6,000. So I paid income tax on $6,000. It became a Roth IRA. I then contributed, I did that uh, two more years until I had $18,000 in total contributions. So $18,000 in total contributions. And then from that level, I had to use a US broker. An international broker won't let you trade in a Roth IRA or, or a traditional IRA because they don't support those. So I had to use a US broker. Once I got the account above 25,000, I just started trading actively and I kept trading and trading and trading in that account. Because here's the thing that's really incredible. All of your trading profit, you could you could do all of your trading you could do in a retirement account which means you pay zero income tax on the on the gains right now and if it's a Roth IRA you'll pay zero income tax when you withdraw that profit so when i turned $583 into 335,000 i had to pay income tax on the 335,000 right i i traded it in a taxable account i had no choice and so i deposited 6,000 the next year in 2018 i made half a million all right, so 500000 And again, I took out $6,000 for my 2018 contribution. And I had to pay income tax on five hundred grand. The next year in 2019, I made, I think it was like 370000 something like that. And again, had to pay income tax on $370,000. This is a lot of income tax. But I got that contribution. So then starting in 2020, I began trading in my Roth IRA. And at that time, I was doing half in a Roth IRA and half in an LLC account. I was doing 50-50 because I wanted 
profit. I wanted to grow the Roth IRA, but I also needed to make actual money because I had things I wanted to, to buy and bills that I needed to pay you know, with my actual trading profit. I then got to a point where I said, you know what? I'm not going to trade in the LLC anymore because I feel like here's the thing. It's an incredible opportunity that you can earn money in a Roth IRA at the rate that we're able to do if you become a successful trader. With my regular, like like when you have a regular job, if you have a W-2, you or even if you have a business, you can't put your business into a Roth IRA. They're, like You have to pay income tax on the profit you make running a business. So Warrior Trading as a software company, I have income and I have income tax that I pay on. And there's nothing I can do about that. YouTube, I get a little bit of income on YouTube and I have to pay income tax on that. There's nothing I can do about that. But my trading profit, I don't need to pay income tax on it if I want to trade in a Roth IRA. So that's the first thing I do. Now, sometimes I hear about people that go to kind of extreme lengths to try to avoid, you know, paying their tax. They're like, oh, I'm going to buy. Oh, well, I, I heard if I, if I, you know, you hear about these very wealthy people who will like buy an airplane, you know, I'll buy an airplane and then I'll write it off against my income. Now I own like a $3 million airplane or something, or they'll buy, they, they'll, just, they'll just find things they can buy that they can then expense against their income. And I kind of think that, um, one of the most obvious things that people can do, although most people don't want to, would be to move to Puerto Rico. Because if you move to Puerto Rico, you won't have federal income tax. You'll have it, you'll have tax in Puerto Rico, but you won't have U.S. federal income tax, and you won't have state income tax. And so a lot of people who are making serious money will move to Puerto Rico, and they'll live there for six months out of the year, six six months and one day out of the year. And then all of a sudden, their income. Then here's the thing: you're you still have a U.S. passport. You're still a U.S. resident. You're you're a Puerto Rican resident, but you can move back to the U.S. at any time. You're not giving up your U.S. citizenship. Now again, this isn't going to be for everyone. But if you're someone who's making millions and millions of dollars, and you're paying half of that in in tax, like you live in California or you live in New York, and you're paying nearly forty five percent of your profit in tax, well, think about it, right? So again, it's it's to each their own. And of course, the the old, the next level would be to move to like you know somewhere that has no income tax at all, like Costa Rica. But then I'm pretty sure you have to give up your U.S. citizen citizenship if you do that. So, um, so so yeah, so Puerto Rico. Um, anyways, or a Roth IRA. I think it's a good idea. So that's what I would do. Um, okay, so let's see. So next question. Um, So, and, and I guess to fully answer the question with the LLC, um, I, I actually, earlier in my career, I used an S-Corp, um, and I prefer an S-Corp because, um, and this is going to get a little complicated, but, but I'll just, I'll just go with it for those that are interested. So with an S-Corp, if you put your trading account in an S-Corp, um, it's a corporation with an S, uh, you've done an S-Corp election. So if you make, let's just say you make a million dollars in your S corp. Um, sorry, you make a million dollars in your S corp. Um, one of the rules is that as an S corp, you have to pay yourself a wage. So let's just say you pay yourself a wage of $100,000. You're going to pay W2 income taxes on um, the 100,000. But then the company can distribute the remaining nine hundred thousand dollars, just for instance, you know, maybe after fees and stuff are paid, as a distribution. This is called um, a K one. And on a distribution, you don't pay um, Medicare or Social Security. So you're actually going to pay you're you're going to pay less money on the income uh, from that nine hundred thousand. And then of course, all the expenses that you have with running the business go through the S corp. It's a little more complicated though to set up because you have to put yourself on like you have to set up get a little payroll for yourself, do withholding, do a W two, um, you know. So it's kind of like to get the accountant and an attorney to help you sort of set this up. You sort of have to be making at least, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, I would say. Um, but if you get to that level, it makes sense. Um, I, I don't think an LLC would really achieve. Um, the same result. I, I think the only benefit of an LLC would be, be that your asset, of, which is your a trading account, would be protected from liability. 
um, you know, which God forbid, like you got in a car accident, someone tried to sue you or something like that, your your LLC, your business would be protected. So um, anyways, I think that that's, that's why some people would use an LLC. Okay. Um, doing a C Corp, would you would be subject to um, double taxation. So most people would do an S Corp. But, you know, I mean, again, there could be scenarios where a C Corp would work, depending on what you're going to do with the proceeds and how much you actually need to pull out. Okay, so let's see. Um, Okay, so next question. So thank you guys, by the way, who are tuned in. Uh, appreciate you guys who have just gotten tuned in in the last few minutes to hit that thumbs up if you haven't already. The thumbs up is um, great for the YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. So Jordan says Dubai and Singapore are places where you keep all the profits if you live there. So, you know, it, the thing, of course, with a lot of people is like, well, but, you know, my family. Well, if you're making millions of dollars, you can your family can fly on a private jet to come visit you. Okay, so let's see. Um, do, 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 do. Thank you guys. Appreciate you guys being here. I'm just looking for a good question that I think everyone will um, benefit from. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah, my so someone just mentioned that my um, day trading course is listed on Investopedia as... Um, the most comprehensive day trading course. Yeah, thank you for saying that. And you're, you're right, it is. All right, so Joshua says, my first month of trading and doing it your style, I've made $3,000. I'm limited to a cash account. How can I get around this? I don't have an overseas account or a non-US address to apply for one. Okay, so look, first of all, congratulations. $3,000 in the month is great. That's a great start. Now, make sure you're taking it slow. One of the things that um, one of the things that are, that are really important is that you recover from your first drawdown because what happens to some traders, and hopefully this won't be you, but just just so you know, what happens to some traders is they have a little bit of progress, and some might even say it's beginner's luck. And then that progress kind of runs out. They start to have a little bit of loss. They get back half. They start to get emotionally fueled. They get frustrated. And then they start trading and getting more and more aggressive. They start now going red on their venture of learning how to trade. And this is the point where some traders will just exit the market and they're gone. They're like, well, that was interesting and I'm done. Uh, now, that I don't want to see happen to you. So what I would encourage is that when you have your first drawdown, and you're going to have it at some point, whether it happens now or it happens in a month or five months or whatever, you'll have your first drawdown at some point. So when you have your first drawdown, Number one, reduce size. This is the opposite of what your brain's going to tell you to do. Your brain's going to tell you to scale up so you can recoup your losses as quickly as possible. You got to do the opposite. Most people lose money, so do the opposite of what most people do. Reduce your size. By reducing your size, you're going to stop the bleeding so you don't draw down even more. All right, now you're going to start trading with smaller size for a little bit. And you're going to need a little period of rebuilding confidence after taking a couple of losses. So trade with smaller size. Stay focused on A quality setups, reduce size and reduce the number of trades. To but you're going to do that by focusing on the highest quality setups. It's going to reduce the number of trades you're taking. Now, once you've made back about half the loss, then start to uh, increase share size again and start to increase the number of trades. So once you've gone through your first drawdown and recouped that loss, that's when it's time to consider scaling up. Now, coming this year on May, I think it's 28th, we're changing to T1 settlement. T1 settlement means your cash account will settle overnight. So currently with a cash account, if you have, let's just say $5,000, on Monday, you could buy 1,000 shares of a stock at $5. You could trade the full $5,000. But then on Tuesday, you have no funds. You have no cash because it hasn't settled. Then on Wednesday, you could trade with the $5,000 again, plus whatever profit or loss from Monday. But then... Again, on Thursday, no trades. So that's because right now we're on a T2 settlement. It takes two days to settle. But it's going to switch to T1 on May 28th. So starting June 1st, essentially, you'll be on T1 settlement, which means you could trade with your full balance every day. You could trade 5000 on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So you're going to be able to trade twice as much in a cash account. 
So that's something to get excited about. That's coming soon. It's not that far away. So if you're trading in an account with like Webull or Robinhood or Thinkorswim, you have no commissions, which is compelling, right? You're just limited right now because if you want a day trade, you would need 25,000 because of the PDT rule. Now, international brokers, depending on where you're located, there are some that don't enforce the PDT rule. So the way to get around that is either you have an international address and you can say, I'm an international resident. I'm not a U.S. resident, which you can't lie. So if you're not a U.S. resident, then then it's not going to work. If it's going to work. If you're a U.S. resident, then you can't do that. So the broker that I use, I'll put a link in the description. I don't like to share the brokers in these broadcasts because sometimes I'll switch the brokers I'm going to use. So people who are watching this like a year from now, because I'll leave it up, all of a sudden I'm giving them the wrong information. So the link in my in my pinned in my comments will have the link to the broker that I'm currently using. Anyways, with that broker, uh, I can fund an account with five hundred or a thousand dollars, and they offer leverage and they don't enforce the PDT rule, which is great. Uh, unfortunately, these brokers still charge a commission, so you're going to pay a bit of money in fees and commissions on that broker. And the question there is, is it worth it? And if it allows you to trade, you know, I, well, let's just say 15 or 20 times in one day, then you're going to be rolling over that money at such a rate that I would say it is worth it, right? But that's that's easy for me to say because of my experience level, the way that I trade, and so on and so forth. There is a real commission, and the commission is, well, there's a commission on every trade you take. Plus, there's a platform fee, which is about $150 a month. So if you really only have a tiny account, it may just not make sense for you right now. It may make more sense to keep trading in um, just your standard, um, uh, you know, like cash account with Webull or Robinhood or Thinkorswim or whatever it is. So anyways, um, I'll put the link here. Um, I'm going to just post it in the comments to the international brokers that I use. And you can check that out. Uh, but anyways, congratulations, um, on that first, um, month and that nice profit. That's really great. Okay. So let's see. So next question. Uh, thank you guys, uh, who are throwing questions in the, um, in the chat feed here. I appreciate that. Okay. So let's see. Um, all right. So I'm going to look for another, uh, good question. So Josh, can you, talk about the difference between trading in a real account versus paper trading. So I encourage people to, um, I always encourage people to paper trade as they're getting started. Because the thing with paper trading is, well, the thing with getting started is that you're going to make beginner mistakes. You're going to press the wrong hot keys. You know, you're going to, you're just going to fumble because that's what it's like getting started. Just like learning to ride a bike. So you have training wheels, you have a helmet, maybe you have knee pads, things like that when you're learning to ride a bike because you you know you're going to fall. So you might as well protect yourself from the, the initial injuries. So with trading, we have the, the privilege of being able to use a simulated trading account so you can start to practice and there's no risk of losing real money. That makes sense. Because so, one of the things I'll say is if you can't make money in a simulator, <laughs> you're not going to make money with real money right? So why even put real money on the line? Why even bother setting up an account and going all that effort if you haven't proven first profitability in a sim? It was naive to do that. So I would say practice in a simulator for at least a few weeks. Look, if you hit the ground running and you make money and you feel really confident, you've got to make your own choices. But I, I would encourage you probably for a few months to practice in a simulator because you're going to gain experience. You're going to start to get comfortable and you're going to learn a lot from that. So trade in a simulator, get comfortable, and then go live. The only problem that some people have is that in a simulator, there are a couple of things that you can't replicate. You can't replicate slippage very well. So in a simulator, when you press the buy button, you'll get filled your whole order. So if you press the buy button for 100,000 shares, you'll fill 100,000 shares. When in reality, you wouldn't have been able to fill that many. So some people will get an artificial sense of confidence that they're going to start making like 500 grand a day when they flip the switch. And that's not realistic because of slippage in the market. So I would generally trade in a simulator with like 100 shares and just use that as like, this is just, I'm not trying to trade with big size or make big money. I'm just trying to show that I can make at least 15 to 20 cents per share per day. So if you're walking away with 15 to $20 a day and you can do that every day for a month, then do that exact same thing with real money with 100 shares. 
See if you can make 15 to $20 a day with 100 shares with real money. If you could do that for a month, month two, go 200 shares. Now you're making 40, you know, 30, $40 a day. Month three, go to 300 shares, 400 shares, 500 shares. Next thing you know, you're trading 1,000 shares. If you're making $100, $200 a day with 1,000 shares, you're making $50,000 a year. Go 2,000 shares. This is the right way to scale up. It's the right way to scale up because you're acclimating yourself to experiencing loss. Because one of the things a simulator can't replicate is the true emotion that comes with losing money. So when people train a simulator with 5, 10, 15,000 shares, and they're like, yeah, I'm going to trade this way with real money. But then they do that for the first time with real money and they're down 10 grand in one day. Big emotions come out. You could lose half your account in one day and then all of a sudden you start to spiral. So, you know, it's just my two cents. But some of my uh, students at Warrior Trading, some of our members who have done the best have been members who traded in a simulator for a long time with small size. Justin, uh, one of our members who's made over a million dollars, he traded with one share, just one share. And because it's proof of concept. It's not about making money in those early days. It's about proving consistency by how many cents per share you can pull out of the market. Because that's what's more scalable. Cents per share. If you're doing 15, 20 cents a day, you know, you could scale the share size, right? But if you're trading 100,000 shares and you're pulling two cents a day out of the market and you're like, oh, look, I'm making $20,000 a day, that's not, it's not going to uh, carry, it's not going to carry over. So, so yeah, I would say the two issues uh, with a simulator is that you can't simulate slippage and it doesn't simulate the emotions. Uh, also, you don't pay borrowing fees for shorting. So it could, it could, you could short almost anything, but it doesn't really replicate um, that it's actually difficult to short a lot of stocks. Um, okay, so I'm just looking at the comments here and the questions. Okay. Oh, internet speeds. Um, so from an internet speed perspective, I've traded with terrible internet. And it's really not a problem that much because the while we're consuming a lot of data, it consumes so much more data to watch YouTube videos or to watch Netflix than it does to stream market data. Market data is not as data intensive. What you do want is a minimum quality of internet and you want a stable internet. You don't want internet that's dropping because you're going to lose quotes. So you want stable internet. Even if it's not crazy fast, it's got to be stable. So for that reason, I would probably prefer, historically, I would have almost always preferred a DSL versus a satellite internet because satellite has more latency and more um, more drops. Even though it can be faster, it has it's not as stable. Well, with Starlink, it's a little bit different. Starlink is very fast um, and it's pretty darn stable when it's working well. But if I was going to choose right now DSL or Starlink, I mean, for my home office, I actually probably would still choose DSL uh, for my home office. For traveling, well, you can't have DSL while you're traveling. Um, but for my home office, DSL or cable, even though it's slower, would be more stable. And, and you know, so for me, I... I Puerto Rico or any of these places, I've had no issue trading uh, on the Wi-Fi there uh, or and on the internet there. No issue at all. Uh, thank you guys uh, who are getting tuned in. So, so one of the reasons that you won't see me shorting is because in a Roth IRA, you are not allowed to short stocks. So that is a little bit of a disadvantage of the Roth IRA. You can't short stocks. And the reason you can't short stocks is because when you short, you subject yourself to the potential of an unlimited loss, right? If you short a stock at $2 and it goes to a million dollars a share, you would have to cover the position. And in order to cover a loss, it, you could be forced to have to make a contribution to your Roth IRA, and that would exceed the maximum annual contributions. So they don't let you short at all to prevent that from happening. Now, you could buy puts on a stock and profit from it going down, if you wanted to, but of course you can only do that on uh, large cap stocks that have well traded options uh, chains. So for small caps, you're you are more or less restricted to trading on the long side. And for me, the way I think about it is in my Roth IRA, I get to keep every dollar I make to the long side because I have no income tax. So if I short, I have to do it in a taxable account, which means I only get to keep about fifty five percent of the profit I make. You know, but I lose 100% of what I lose. I mean, right? I mean, you can, I guess you, in theory, you could write off your losses, but, but no one's intending to be a losing trader. 
So in practice, you only get to keep about half of what you make. Now that's for me because I'm in a high income bracket. If you're in a lower income bracket, the percentage is better, right? And depending on where you live and things like that. <clears throat> okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, thank you guys uh, who have tuned in just in the last uh, five or 10 minutes. I'm going to broadcast for about an hour. So we've got a little bit more broadcast uh, time coming up here. And I want to try to answer as many questions as we can. So thank you guys for throwing some questions in here, especially questions that you think other people will be interested in um, learning the answer to. Okay. So Richard says, it's so hard to make 5% on a trade. Uh, don't you want to stay in for big money? And I, I would kind of disagree with you on that. Um, I don't find it hard to buy a stock at $3 and sell it at $3.15. That's 5%. I don't find it hard to buy a stock at 5 and sell it at $5.25 for 5%. I actually find that that is much more consistent and easily achievable than trying to hit 25, 35, 40% returns. Because let's just think about it for a second. You know, how many times have you seen a stock that's at $5 a share, right? It's a, it squeezes up to five, it pops up to 525 and then comes all the way back down. Traders who are holding for that move to six or seven, they end up stopping out flat or even for a loss. Traders who are happy to take the 5% off the table, walk away with profit. Traders who are consistently walking away with profit are traders who have lots of small base hits. Now, occasionally they'll take a bigger loss because, you know, they get in something at five and it does a jackknife down to, you know, 460 or something like that, or, or even 430. So they'll take big losses from time to time, but they're generally going to be really consistent about locking up those base hits. Traders who are swinging for the 30, 40, 50% returns are going to have longer periods of like not getting anything and getting small losses and then you know the occasional big winner and then longer periods of waiting and then like bigger winners but these long periods of waiting can be difficult to endure and it can be emotionally frustrating to have 15 trades in a row where you were up five percent you didn't take it off the table and then you drop back down meanwhile you're watching these base hit traders who just keep grinding away and it's like the turtle who's winning the race so this is the way I trade. I just focus on base hit, base hit, base hit. And look, occasionally I'll we'll be in a market where I'm getting more than base hits because the market's just really strong. We're seeing big moves, but I'm still focused primarily on just hitting base hit, base hit, base hit. So, you know, that's something um, that I, I, I just don't think it's as difficult to hit 5% winners. Um, but again, maybe it's the, the type of stocks I'm trading. So if you're trading a $40, $50, $75 stock, it's going to be a little bit harder. How can I day trade without level two? So if you're day trading without level two, it's going to be really hard for you to be a scalp trader and to be taking quick profits. Um, you're almost going to be forced to focus more on five-minute timeframes, longer timeframes, and even daily timeframes where the level two is less important. So you can day trade without level two, but it would be next to impossible to do it on the 10 second and one minute time frames, and to participate in some of these really extreme moves that we see if you don't have level two. It really is. Uh, it's an important skill to have because the chart is historical context. The chart tells us everything that's already happened. And we use the chart to make sort of a prediction of what we think is going to happen. But when we're actually looking at the level two, you can already see all the orders that have been placed. They haven't been executed yet, but they've already been placed. So now you start to be able to create context of future because you're like, well, geez, the chart looks good. But on the level two, I see a 1 million share seller that is that we're going to run into in about you know 10 cents. So you already can kind of predict the future there. You know that we're going to have a resistance there. The chart doesn't show it yet but you could see it because it's right there on the level two. So trading without that information would be, um, you would be missing quite a lot. And if you're doing it just because you're trying to save money I, and by not paying for level two data, I think that that's a mistake. Um, you know, it's, 
if you want to perform at the level of other traders, if you want to pull money out of the market consistently, you need to come uh, to the table with sort of the minimum level of, of tools that other people are using, I think. Um, okay, so let's see. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely times um, when the market is choppier. And I, I know that feeling of that frustration of like, oh, man, you know, we we had a stretch where everything that was hitting the scanners was like super strong and continuing another 15, 20, 30, 40 percent, like really big extensions. And then, you know, all of a sudden we kind of come into a period where things are moving up, but then they just sort of stall out and the first pullback doesn't get bought up. It just kind of goes lower. And, you know, that's a market that's going to be a little bit more difficult to trade. And I get it, you know, it's, but the thing is, this is the ebb and the flow of trading. It's not always crazy, crazy hot. It, it, it does, um, you know, it's oscillating between hot and cold, just like the tide that kind of comes in and then goes back out, comes back in and then goes back out. Let's see. Um, by the way, for those of you guys um, who are tuned in, if you want to continue um, over the weekend here, over the next few days, if you want to watch uh, some classes and you want to uh, join me next week, I'll put a link here for a uh, two-week trial at Warrior Trading for uh, 20 bucks. And if you start it today, then part of that trial will give you access to a selection of classes from my Warrior Pro curriculum. So you could spend the weekend studying and then getting yourself ready for Monday. And then you'd be able to trade with me um, through Monday and, and through the week after. So I'll just put a link here for those of you guys that are interested in doing the uh, that two-week trial. It's $20. So, I mean, look, I, I you get free market data during that period. I'm actually going to lose money for people that are on the $20 trial because it costs me more to give you services for two weeks. But... We do it because we know a lot of people are going to do the trial. They're going to enjoy it. And then they're going to say, you know what? Maybe I'll join Ross in his full Warrior Pro curriculum. So, you know, I'm happy to do it. For those of you guys who are just going to do a two-week trial and nothing more, you'll get a lot out of it. You'll learn a lot about my strategy. You'll watch some classes. And um, and I want you to have that and enjoy it. Uh, again, it's, this isn't something that is about making money. It's just trying to at least offset the cost of you guys being... Uh, streaming that data for two weeks. So I hope you guys, um, some of you guys take advantage of that. Okay, so let's see. Um, explain how to trade pre-market. Okay, so trading pre-market is, uh, is very simple. You could trade pre-market with really any broker. Now, some brokers will require you to change your order settings pre-market. So your order type would change. So when you're opening your actual order entry window, you know, where you've got your buy and you've got your sell button, you will you might have what's called a TIF, which is your time and force. This is a drop down that'll give you different options. Uh, it might say day by default, and you have to change it to say uh, pre-market so, or after hours. So you might have to change the setting. If you're trying to buy pre-market and your order keeps getting rejected, 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 the first thing to do is check your time and force. The next is check the order type. You cannot use market orders pre-market. You have to use a limit order. So if I see a stock, let's say trading at $5 and I want to buy you know, 3,000 shares of it, what I will do is I'll write up a limit order in my order entry window to buy um, whatever, what did we say? Whatever, let's just say 5,000 shares and I'll put the limit order at 505. So then I'll send it, I'll press the buy button and my order is going to go to the market. And I'll fill 5,000 shares up to a price no higher than 505. So if there was only, let's say, 1,000 shares for sale at $5, and at 502, there was another 2,000 shares for sale, and then at 505 or whatever, there was another 3,000 shares, I would fill and I'd have a blended sort of average of about, you know, 502, you know, four or five or something like that for that 5,000 share block. And that, well, this is the same as the way you would fill during regular trading hours if you used a market order. It would just do it automatically. But with a limit order, you you have to stipulate the most you're willing to pay. The reason they don't allow market orders pre-market is because pre-market can be very volatile. But volatility is opportunity. And that's what I like. I like volatility. I like to see stocks that are moving, that have the potential to make big moves. So pre-market, we have no market orders, but we also have no stop orders because stop orders are traditionally a stop market order. 
So there's a little bit of risk there with the fact that you can't use a stop order as a safety net pre-market. What that means is I've got to have my hand over the button to sell. So if I don't like something, I can bail out just by pressing control Z. Control Z is my bailout button. And that order is a sell order, which does a uh, full position. So it'll sell my full position and it actually will calculate bid price minus 10 cents. So it automatically calculates it. So when I press control Z, control Z right here, it goes full position bid minus 10 sell. It executes immediately. So if I have, you know, 1,173 shares because I got a partial fill, it takes my full position and puts it in there. If the bid is, you know, $4 uh, or whatever, $5, five dollars and 73 cents it automatically sends the order at 563 so it's just instant and this allows me to get in and out very quickly so i can lock up my losses get out of the way if something is de declining but i can also get in something very quickly by pressing my hotkey uh, to buy which is shift one so i press shift one to buy to get in something that's strong something that's moving quickly okay um so so Zona, you're an aggressive trader. Were you born this way or did you have to train yourself into it? You're right. I am an aggressive trader and, and so much so that I almost sometimes feel like I have to train it out of me because my instinct is to be very aggressive. My instinct is to chase. When a stock is moving higher, I'm buying, I'm adding. And in a hot market, that's where I've been able to make up to half a million dollars in one day. Now, my results aren't typical. As always, I'll say that. So just to share that with you. But when the market is hot, I will lean in and I can do incredibly well. But when the market is cold, I just keep hitting myself, you know, hitting a wall. I'll add, I'll add, and then it'll drop. I'll add, I'll add, and then it'll drop. And it's like again and again, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, I need to stop being so aggressive. I'm being too aggressive. So I'm not good at kind of switching from hot market mode to cold market mode because I'm just sort of tuned to being aggressive. Now, I think that early in my career, I was a little nervous when I was pressing the buy button. You know, when I was first getting in, like I, I did feel that sense of anxiety, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to take real risk. But I think what overcame that for me was some of the early times where I took a trade with like 10,000 shares and in an instant, I'd be up 2,500 bucks or four grand. And that's like, whoa, I got excited. And so I think I kind of chased that excitement of like the big wins. And when the market's hot, I'm getting them and I'm getting the reward. I'm getting that adrenaline rush. And it it's it's like that aggression is getting rewarded. But in the cold market, I can get really frustrated. And so, you know, for me, that's something that I deal with where in the hot market, my PL is like going up really quickly. But when it's cold, what ends up happening to me is uh, it cools off. And then, you know, I take a, a couple big losses being too aggressive. And then I try to recoup losses. And I take another big loss. And then, you know, I, I, I just kind of keep kind of like jumping up and down like this. Like I'll have a day where it's hot and I make money and then the next day I'll lose and then I'll make money and then I'll lose and then I'll make it and then I'll lose. So it's much more jumpy like this when the market's cold. Now, generally, I'm still green. I, I don't know. And I should knock on wood before I say this, but um, I've had red months for sure. I had a red month. Um, I had, I think, one red month last year. Um and I think that was the first red month I'd had in like a year and a half. But I typically will figure I might have one or even two red months in a year. That's not uncommon. That's not unheard of for me to have two red months in a year. However, I have not, since I turned the corner as a profitable trader, had two back-to-back -back red months. And I feel really superstitious even saying that. So look, it could happen. It could happen. And if it happens, it's okay. But... Um, the reason it would happen would be because in month one... I suffered a drawdown probably at the beginning of the month and it was a big one and I was not able to recoup. And then in month two, I had like a freak loss and or I had two months in a row with like freak losses, which sometimes happens. I mean, trading is risky, so we know this is a risk. So a freak loss would be like, you know, I got into a trade and then it got halted on a T12 or I got into a trade, got halted pending news and then it opened like 50% lower and I lost like 50 grand. and you know, that's not going to kill me. 
in terms of, you know, having made over $10 million, but it would be a painful loss and it might be hard to make it back in just a couple of weeks. So anyways, um, so all that was to say that I am trained to, I, I, I don't think, I think I am naturally pretty aggressive and I'm trying to train myself to be a little bit more conservative. Um, so we all come to the table with our, with our own aptitudes and our own kind of just disposition. Um, and, and for me, mine has perhaps been, um, you know, one that's held me back when markets have been cold and other traders have been a little bit better, um, you know, just being like keeping their head down and focusing on base hits. And this is something I struggled with in this last month because I had, you know, over $100,000 of profit in February. And then coming into March, I was swinging hard. I was up $30,000 in like four days. And then I lost 20 grand in two days. See, I got a little sloppy. I got, I started getting really aggressive, even though things were cold. And then I spent the next two weeks trying to recoup the losses. And then I had another two red days. And now I'm like, I'm still a little bit uh, down versus my peak in March. But what I'm telling myself, as always, is it doesn't matter because March is over. March is over. And I walked away with more profit than I had at the beginning of the month. And now we start a brand new month of April. And my goal is to walk away at the end of April with a little more profit than I had at the beginning of the month. I want each month to stand on its own and each month to try to be a green month. And that's a nice opportunity each month to clean, clear the slate and to start fresh. So whatever happened in the previous month, it doesn't really matter anymore. It's behind us. Now we have a new chance to, to lay a solid foundation. So for those of you that want to lay a solid foundation with me for the next two weeks, join me for the two-week trial. 20 bucks, two-week trial. You'll get to uh, watch a bunch of episodes over this weekend that are straight out of my Warrior Pro curriculum. And then bright and early Monday morning, 7 a.m., right about 7 a.m., I'll be live streaming. I do my cute my my live broadcast every day for Warrior Pro members from about 7 a.m. till between 10 and 11. Sometimes I go as late as noon or one o'clock, depending on what the market's doing. And uh, you guys will be able to be tuned in for the whole thing. So, uh, so yeah, I encourage you guys to join us uh, here. I hope you enjoyed this episode. This is a, a free Q and A here on YouTube. So thanks for tuning in. I hope you hit that thumbs up. I hope you subscribe to the channel. I have some more episodes coming soon. And uh, join me uh, for this two week trial. Uh, here today and then you can watch some more classes uh over the weekend all right so thank you guys as always for being here and i'll remind you that trading is risky my results aren't typical so manage your risk take it slow and i'll see you back here uh, bright and early on monday morning